Well, hello there everyone and welcome to another UXW Bill video. I've got a bit of a project that I'm going to share with you in this particular video. This is something that I'll actually be needing to use in the near future because as it happens, the Alice Chalmers 8070's air conditioning system, it didn't last very long after being charged up. And the problem that it has, which I'll bounce off of those of you in the viewing audience who happen to be a little more experienced than I am, is one of approximately normal head pressure, but very high suction pressure, like around 116 PSI or so. Now my first thought was that maybe the expansion valve had failed wide open and was dumping refrigerant just as fast as it would come into that evaporator. And looking back at that now, I realize that was not the right train of thought to have, not the right line of troubleshooting, and not very likely to be a symptom of that problem. Now what I think might be going on, I think the compressor is physically defective. I think there's an internal problem. I think it might be leaking by from the high side to the low side or something like that. But if any of you out there in the viewing audience have got some thoughts on that, I certainly wouldn't mind hearing them because I am really just starting out in this field and I certainly don't claim to be a super technician nor someone who knows absolutely everything about this. I'm about the furthest thing from either one of those two items. But one of the things that I'll be doing when I go to work on that system, we'll be giving it a complete overhaul. We're gonna change out the, I already changed out the metering device just in case that did not help, unfortunately. It was cheap though. Um, we'll be changing out the condenser coil because the old one is of a type that cannot be flushed. Who knows what's kicking around in there. Be changing out the metering device for a new one. Be changing out the filter dryer, changing out the compressor, and of course, flushing the whole system because I have noticed the presence of contaminated oil or what they commonly refer to as black death inside that air conditioning system. Now, back when I worked on the Alice Chalmers 7020, since I figured that job was likely to be a one-off or at least one-off for a very long time, I bought this inexpensive flushing canister and I'm sure you can probably tell where this is going already. This thing was absolutely terrible. I mean, it was cheap, that's the only good thing I can really say about it. This thing leaked all over the place and I should have shopped around and gotten something better, preferably from a name brand, such as a company like New Calgon or similar. If you wanna pause the video and read the warnings on this for any reason, and you might for reasons I'll get to here in just a moment, you can certainly feel free to do that. These are written not only in uh, rather butchered English, but they're also written in Chinese over here on the other side. And I don't know if there's anybody in the viewing audience that um, speaks Chinese or understands the language. I am certainly not that person. I will say that when I fed this into Apple Translate by way of my phone, the results were wildly different every time I did it, and they were also moderately hilarious. If it still happens that I have that screenshot, I will certainly include it in the video. But I would be curious if there does happen to be anyone watching the video who is fluent, or at least reasonably so, in the Chinese language, if you would be willing to hit some of the high points on this and see just how close the two labels actually are to one another. We'll set that aside though. That thing was terrible. It leaked all over the place. I think I got more system flush on me than I did in the system on the 7020. Now the nice folks over at AP Air, and I hope this won't be flickering too badly, it doesn't look too bad on the camera right now, but watching the finished video may very well prove a different thing. They sell this large flushing tank, and since I want to run a lot of flush through that system, especially paying attention to the evaporator, this seemed like it would be a really nice way to go. Unfortunately, that thing is several hundred dollars and it's just not in my budget right now. So then I got to thinking, well, I wonder, I wonder if maybe I can make something like that. And so that's what we're going to try here tonight with a couple of different things. This is kind of a proof of concept. I've got some nitrogen here. I've got two long refrigerant hoses. Again, these were cheap, but they're never going to be used to carry a refrigerant or vacuum or anything like that. They will be dedicated solely to this purpose. We've got a little bit of water, a funnel, the bore scope, and a brand new fresh recovery cylinder that just showed up today. And all in the world, this will have in it right now. 
is a little bit of dry nitrogen from the factory. So we'll go ahead and get that out of there. Because what I want to do, get my arm out of the way there, I actually want to take a look and see inside this container, I want to see how this is architected to see if this is feasible. Because it's common for these things to contain a dip tube so that if you need to feed liquid refrigerant into a system, say you've recovered that refrigerant and now you're putting it back into the same system again, you can do that by opening one of these valves that is associated with the dip tube. And I say one of these valves because you can't always guarantee that the colors are going to tell you where the dip tube inside your recovery cylinder actually happens to be. Now in this case, they're probably telling the truth because this one says liquid and this one says vapor. We'll find out here in just a moment. There's a, there's a threaded in plug here. I believe this is for some sort of an overfilling prevention device that you can optionally fit to these. I've never actually seen anything like that, nor have I seen one of these so equipped but that's what the distributor of this particular cylinder says. Now something I'm very curious about, when these are brand new, they come with this little net wrapped around the bottom of the container. I can't imagine that this serves any sort of useful purpose when the cylinder is in its normal operation and being used to recover refrigerant, but also can't see how this would really afford any meaningful protection during the shipping process because anything the shippers are going to expose and subject this container to is going to be a lot worse than that piddly little mesh can hope to resolve. All right, so the next thing we need to do is we need to get that little plug out of there and then we'll have a look inside with our borescope and see what's going on. And I'm sorry it's taken me seven minutes to get to that point here in the video, but sometimes that's just the way things go and brevity, as you already know, is not my strong suit. So that totally didn't go according to plan. I gave up, now we're back at it tomorrow because I could not get that plug out of there for anything that I tried. Tried a regular crescent wrench, tried a pipe wrench, tried hammering on the wrench, that's tool abuse right there. And then I tried this cheater pipe made out of an old piece of electrical conduit. And of course, that's an even worse thing to do to your wrenches. And not only was this thing almost impossible to get any kind of a grip on so it wouldn't spin around, I certainly don't have anything I could put it in to hold it or anything I could press it against. And it's not really big enough that you could sit on it or wedge your leg against it or anything like that. It doesn't really matter. I wasn't able to do it. So this morning I reached out to the key keeper and he gave it a couple of ugga duggas with his um, impact tool. And finally, finally we've got it out of there and I'll tell you something right away, I'm definitely interested in seeing what the insides of this recovery cylinder look like because these threads, and I've cleaned them up a little bit, probably ought to run some kind of a chaser on them or something because they still look terribly dirty. It wasn't cross threaded at least not as best I can tell, but there's definitely metal fragments in these. I wonder if they just kind of gave this a big old ugga dugga with a similar impact tool over on the assembly line when they were putting this cylinder together. Let's take a look at these threads down here. We can get the camera to focus on those. We ought to get a really nice picture. 4K resolution, you know. But now with that thing out of there, we're ready to take a look at what's in there with the borescope. And I'm certainly interested in and looking forward to doing that, and maybe you are as well. So I'll try to bring you along for the ride if I can. All right, I would imagine that trying to capture a video of this with the phone while holding the borescope and the phone is going to be about a five-hand job. One thing we can see right away is, wow, that thing looks disgusting inside. I guess I would have figured that the insides would be at least primered or coated or something, and. They certainly don't look it, but you can see the dip tube right there. And again, I'll take some video of this, maybe I'll narrate it, and I'll see if I can get it included with this video for your viewing pleasure and curiosity.
does appear that the dip tube reaches nearly to the bottom of the tank, if not completely. I'm still amazed by how nasty that looks inside there, how rusty and disgusting that is. Maybe this is not the best approach for converting into a flushing tank. I certainly don't want all that crap getting loose and floating around inside the air conditioning system to cause problems. We'll try it anyway and see what happens because sometimes the only way to know is just to try it for yourself and see what happens. So just as a test I went ahead and put some water in there with the help of a handy funnel. Now we'll try pressurizing the thing and see what happens. Here's everything just about ready to go for the pressurization. Got some pressure from my nitrogen tank going through the regulator. This shorty hose. Got a valve here to control it. This is just a way for me to stick a pressure gauge on there. It's my core removal tool, but it's got a little stem on the side here that you can attach a gauge or something similar to if you want. Got this valve open like I want it. This one I want to make sure is closed because I've already had one shower today and I'm not really feeling like taking another. So let's go ahead and just open this up. Start bringing the pressure up slowly here. And we'll see what happens. I'm sure we don't seem to be leaking around this thing. We might be leaking somewhere. I'm feeling, feeling the flow of gas, at least I thought I was. Well, I'm not sure. Well, we'll just keep going and see if it holds. Yeah, I'm leaking around this silly threaded plug. Why do I have a feeling this thing's going to be the absolute bane of my existence with regard to this? Maybe this is not the good idea that I thought it was at the time. But if you don't try things, you'll never know. Go ahead and shut that off, depressurize the hose, and we'll see what happens. Now, the way that this should work over here on the side with the blue handle, which at least in theory doesn't have a dip tube, and I'm certainly hoping that's the case because this is pointed right at me and I really don't want to have to go and dry all my clothing. We should just get nitrogen gas out of that side. On the other side though, with the dip tube, as soon as I open this valve, we'll pressurize our hose, and then over here at the other side of the hose, I have that little valve. And once we get the nitrogen out of the line, what I'm hoping to see is the water start to come out of the cylinder. And I'm just curious with the amount of gas that's in here right now, how much water we'll actually be able to push out. If we'll get all of it or if some of it will be stuck in there and there won't be enough gas to continue pushing it out, or if there'll actually be a little extra gas. And anybody who's ever made spicy food for dinner knows that a little extra gas doesn't usually hurt anything too bad. Okay, got kind of a fan spray out of that. I think the reason for that... Watch me point this at my iPhone and have it go off and ruin that. <laughs> I think the reason for that bifurcated spray is actually the Schrader core depressor that's in the end of this valve. Now, some of you in the viewing audience might be wondering how I'm going to get the water that's left behind in that container out of there because we probably don't want to pump water through our air conditioning system, even with the flushing compound. 
And the answer to that is fairly simple. If I slap a vacuum pump on this, I can actually cause all the water that's inside there to boil off. And I think, I think I've pretty well gotten all the water that was in there and still have a little bit of nitrogen, which in this case is of course being used as a propellant gas. So I think this might actually work pretty well if the inside of that container's condition does not become an issue. I would recommend doing this only in a well-ventilated area. definitely be working on this outdoors, so that should not be a problem. So as always, I'd certainly like to thank you for taking the time to watch, and I am definitely interested in hearing your constructive commentary about this particular video and anything that you've seen discussed in it, especially if, again, you'd like to lend any technical feedback toward the diagnosis of the air conditioning system on that old Alice Chalmers tractor. And just as sort of a quick little postscript to close up this video for those who might be curious, this is what the water that was pumped out of that recovery cylinder looks like. I do see a few paint particles floating around in here. I don't consider that particularly serious. I also see a slight skin of oil on the water, but I would imagine that probably has more to do with the fact that most of my refrigerant hoses have been subjected to the flow of refrigeration oil at some point or another in their lifetime and it just simply happened to transfer through as I was bringing the nitrogen into the cylinder.